after three years, multiple trips and nearly 80 rolls of film shot, is the Bronica SQA worth it? Back in the day when photography was actually good and not digital, Bronica decided to release a new series of cameras and the SQ series was Bronica's middle of the road 6x6 model. It sat in the middle of the ETR 645 and the GS 6x7 systems. Now within the SQ series itself, the SQA is pretty much the middle child, with the SQ coming before it and the SQAI coming after it. Now there was the motorized SQAM and the SQB, but we're not going to talk about those. So why did I buy this camera in the first place? Well, I was in the market for my first medium format camera and I thought that the 6x6 square format would be a good place to start jumping in. While I was researching these cameras, there were a few things I wanted, which were an interchangeable lens camera, and it had to have film backs and a waist level finder, because I'd never used a camera with those before, and I wanted to see what that was like. So the choice basically came down to this, or a Hasselblad of some kind. Now there are options like the SL66, but I just wasn't aware of those at the time as well. Now at the time, I didn't want to spend too much money on a new format, so I went with the Bronica series instead of shelling out the extra shekels for a 500 series. Now when I bought this camera it came with the 80mm PS lens, a lens hood, the waist level finder and a 120 6x6 back in a kit off eBay from the UK. Now I actually bought this camera while I was in Vietnam on holiday in 2019 so that while I was on the 16 hours of flying back home the camera would be waiting for me when I got back. Also, I bought this camera before the Brexit rules kicked in and you could buy gear from the UK without getting bent over a barrel on import duty. And now I can't buy from the UK because I have to pay import charges, so good job Brexit. Over the three years I've had this camera, I've actually collected quite a lot of accessories, kind of randomly from kits and local sellers and opportunistic buys. Now these include the 150 PS lens, which is here, the 50 mm S lens, a metered prism, the speed grip, a 645 back, a 6x6 120 back, and the quite rare 135N and W backs with the matching focusing screen, along with a bellows hood and a Polaroid back that I never use. Mostly because the Polaroid takes peel apart film, and that shit is expensive as all hell. And rare. So I actually haven't used this camera for a little bit since I've been getting much more into shooting 4x5 lately. But to use it a little bit more and dispel any rose tinted glasses I have about it, I decided to take it out to Ackill Island with some friends a few weeks ago. So when it comes to the lenses available for the system, they are actually Bronica's own creations, and they're pretty damn good. The 80-28 PS lens is actually really good, and very sharp for a normal lens. The 
the 150 is a very solid portrait lens and I actually love shooting portraits on it. Now when it comes to the 50mm lens I have, which is the wide angle S lens, it's not that great. It can be pretty soft and I have heard that the PS version is supposed to fix that, but I don't have one and I've never shot with one so I can't test that. But there are a very good range of lenses available for this camera, all the way from a 35mm fisheye to a 500mm telephoto lens for all the lunatics out there. Interestingly, Bronica developed all their own optical technology, as far as I know, and it actually ended up kind of being their demise. Because these lenses were so good across all their systems, they ended up getting bought out by Tamron. So when you look at those fancy new Tamron lenses that are coming out, that are really good, they're probably built on the back of the Bronica lenses. And when it comes to film backs for this system, they are kind of insane with the 6x6 and 6x5 backs. However, the crowning jewel is of course the quite pricey and rare 135 backs. And that is because this can shoot a 56 by 24 millimeter panorama on 35 millimeter film. And it is a super cool option to have. Now this particular back is actually the N back, not the W. However, I actually have a W insert and I show you how that all works in a separate video, which I will link down below, of course. Also, all the film backs I have for this system are very reliable. I've never had a fat roll or a single light leak once over the last three years of using this camera. So when handling the camera in the waist level finder configuration like this, it handles really, really well and is an absolute joy to shoot in this mode. And I actually, in fact, prefer shooting with this setup. Now I do have the prism here, however, it's not really all that practical because it needs to have the speed grip attached. Otherwise, you just can't hold it and shoot it up to your eye like so. It, uh, it just kind of doesn't work at all. Now, this particular prism is the metered prism and it just has a simple scented waiter metering setup and enables aperture priority mode on this camera. Now, that is because this camera is actually mostly electronic. Now, there are other prisms available. In particular, there is a plain prism and a more advanced metering prism as well with a spot metering mode. However, I don't have that and I've never used it, so I can't make any comment on it. Now, as handy as having a metered prism is, it does make the camera actually just too big for my bag and is a real pain in the ass to get out, set up, put the prism on, take off all the covers and all that nonsense. So I just prefer to use it with a waist level viewfinder and a handheld light meter. Now the size and weight of this camera are actually quite reasonable. It is no wider or taller than a full frame DSLR. However, it is quite a bit deeper, but it still fits very nicely into all of my camera bags. Now when it comes to the controls on the camera, they actually are pretty great. All the knobs and dials are in the right places. However, the camera is electronic and does require a battery to work. Now this does come with an advantage because it allows the shutter speed to reach from 1 500th of a second all the way down to eight seconds. So it's actually a pretty good camera for low light shooting. You don't have to do any manual timing beyond one second because it can go down to eight seconds. Now also, there is no bulb mode on this camera. The SQAI version has an actual bulb mode available, but it's not really advisable to use that. Now, if you want to do really long exposures on these, there's actually a switch on the underside of the lens that you enable to turn on a T mode, and that will allow you to lock the shutter open mechanically as long as needed, so you can take any length of an exposure. However, if you are going to do these long exposures, you really do need to enable the mirror lockup on the side of the camera because the mirror slap on this is pretty wild. Now, when you do have the mirror locked up though, all of the lenses have leaf shutters in them, which are super quiet. So when this is on a tripod with the mirror locked up, it is actually a really stable shot and you can get some really cool long exposures. As for other features on the camera, it has all of the kind of usual bells and whistles from this era. It has a interlock system on the dark slide so you can't remove the back or fire the shutter while the dark slide are, is in or out. 
so it's very hard to make a mistake and accidentally destroy a roll of film. It also has a cable release port on the side, um, it has a you know, shutter sink port, aperture ring, all the usual bells and whistles that this kind of camera has. Now there is one kind of annoying issue and that is when you're attaching the speed grip to the camera you have to remove this little lever by pulling out a pin and this lever actually comes off and it's super difficult to get a replacement for so do not lose this. Make sure to put it away safely and zip it up in a pocket or leave it at home if you're going to be using the speed grip on the camera. So is a system camera like this worth it? Well I would actually say yes. There is a very good reason these types of camera exist. Having multiple backs with different films is actually really useful. On the Akul trip, for example, I had Portra 160 and Velvia 50 in different backs, so I could shoot landscapes and portraits at the same time. It also allowed me to shoot two different formats of 646 and 645, which was also really useful because, because Velvia 50 is expensive and I wanted to get those extra few frames. So now we have to do the obvious and ask the question, is the Hasselblad San as good as the real McCoy? And I know a lot of us do feel the gas field surrounding the V system and it's beautiful Carl Zeiss lenses, but the Bronica is actually no slouch at all. The lenses are really solid and can produce a really nice image. Even compared to the Hasselblad glass, these PS lenses can definitely hold their own. The 80 and the 150 are solid performers. I also hear that the 65mm is an excellent performer along with the 250. However, this, this particular 50mm lens is a little weak, so definitely get the PS versions if they are available. Now, the actual difference between the S and PS versions is that while Bronica was developing all their different camera systems for medium format, when they built the GS1 system, which is their 6x7 camera, they came up with new lens coatings and a much better kind of ergonomic design for the lenses. And then using that, they went back and refreshed the lenses for the SQ and the ETR systems as well. And that is what results in the PS lenses. So if you do have an option to get the PS version of a lens, I would pick it over the S version if you can find them. They tend to be a hair sharper, but the main advantage is that the coatings are a little bit better so they resist flare and the contrast can be a little bit better. However, if you can't find the PS lenses and you can get the S lenses cheap, just buy them anyway. They're solid. So overall, I actually think the Bronica is a solid pickup. It makes great images and it works well at a cheaper price point and it also punches quite a bit above its weight. So while the Hasselblad may have the strongest gas fields possible, the Bronica can actually scratch that itch pretty well. As for me though, that gas field is pulling me towards a Hasselblad and it is looking very likely that I'm going to be picking one up. And unfortunately that means I'm going to be selling this Bronica system at some point in the future. I will be very sad to see it go. It was my introduction to the wonders of medium format and using a waist level finder for the first time. It's been an absolute joy to own and I've learned so many photography skills and all kinds of things from using it over the last three years. So I will be very sad when the day comes and it has to be packed into a box and shipped off. I actually hope I can sell it locally to someone in a local analog group and I'll be able to see someone else enjoy this great camera. Anyway, that's it for this video guys. I'll see you next time.